Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending this session. In the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to talk about one of the most important gynecologic disease and the main cause of infertility, endometriosis. And I'm going to start my presentation today telling you a story. This is Kelly, a 38-year-old woman complaining about infertility for the past three years, dysmenorrhea, and deep dyspareunia. And to better understand Kelly's complaints, let's take a look at her gynecological background. At the age of 30, she had her first period. At 15, she started using oral contraceptives due to heavy cramps, acne, and a diagnosis of polycystic ovaries. She kept on using it continuously, doing her annual checkups without abnormalities. Being a very successful lawyer, she focused on her career. At the age of 30, she got married. Two years later, the couple decided that it was time to have a baby. Kelly stopped using oral contraceptives after 17 years taking the medication. Six months later, she started having menstrual cramps and deep dyspareunia. After three years of unsuccessful attempts and having visited three different gynecologists, she decided to see a reproductive medicine doctor. And then he asked for specific exams, a hysterosalpingography, which demonstrated elevated and dilated tubes with late contrast retention and a transvaginal sonography after bowel preparation. And that's how we met. She had severe endometriosis affecting the anterior and posterior compartments of the pelvis with heterocervical, vaginal, and bowel lesions. Her doctor recommended an IVF treatment or surgery. This is the most common clinical scenario today, the long use of contraceptives and women delaying pregnancy for over their 30s, which are responsible for the late diagnosis of endometriosis and infertility. Long use of contraceptives also mask disease and the lack of specific exams also contribute to the late diagnosis of endometriosis and infertility. So this is the equation of endometriosis today. So we are facing a chronic disease that will impact women from the very early stage to the menopause. And why is so important to know about endometriosis? Because endometriosis is an endemic disease. It affects around 176 million women worldwide. The average today is that one in 10 women have endometriosis during reproductive and most productive years, and up to 60% of those with infertility. So let's review the basic concept of the disease. Endometriosis is defined as the presence of endometrial gland and stroma located outside the uterine cavity associated with fibrosis and inflammatory reaction. It is characteristically a polymorphic disease that can be presented as superficial implants on the peritoneal surface, ovarian cysts called endometriomas and deep lesions that infiltrate the peritoneal surface for more than five millimeters called deeply infiltrative endometriosis. We're going to focus our attention on dye, which is a chronic, progressive, and multifocal disease with unknown cure and preventive mechanisms. And the diagnosis is a challenge in the clinical practice. According to the European Society for Reproductive Medicine, it can take up to 10 years or even more between the onset of the symptoms and the final diagnosis. Throughout the years, over than 200 biomarkers have been proposed as a screening test to diagnose endometriosis without success. In endometriosis, we don't have the same recipe that fits all patients. Treatment should be individualized and personalized, 
And even with a good screening test, imaging is the core of clinical practice. A detailed imaging mapping is crucial for any clinical decision. There is no more place for a diagnostic laparoscopy. And we have excellent imaging modalities to investigate endometriosis. I'm going to focus my presentation on transvaginal sonography after bowel preparation, which should be the first line imaging modality. And before I start talking about the ultrasound to diagnose endometriosis, I'm going to show you a very common situation. This is a pelvic MRI demonstrating severe endometriosis affecting bladder, vesco-uterine pouch, heterocervical space, vagina, and the rectosigmoid column. Do you believe that in this case, it's possible to have a previous normal transvaginal ultrasound report? Believe me or not, this is a very common situation. And basically it happens because people involved don't search for such lesions routinely. And here you can see the difference. The ultrasound dedicated to investigate endometriosis will focus not only on the routine evaluation of the uterus, endometrium, and ovaries, but also on all pelvic structures that can be potentially compromised by the disease, such as bladder, heterocervical space, vagina, ureters, bowel, and pelvic peritoneum. So TVS should be the first line imaging modality following a detailed imaging algorithm to investigate endometriosis. It's also important to evaluate the mobility of the uterus, ovaries, and bowel. The bimanual examination is mandatory to perform a good exam. An abdominal palpation combined with a gentle pushing the probe it's also important to standardize protocol and nomenclature use in order to speak the same language among all involved. So let's see the recipe. Basically, we have three steps, patient preparation, imaging algorithm, and the report. Bowel preparation is crucial to optimize the results, not only to investigate bowel lesions, but also to improve the overall view of the pelvic cavity without artifacts. It includes the day before and the day of the examination. On the day before, they will take a mild oral laxative twice and keep a low residue diet all day. And on the day of the examination, they will keep the diet and apply one rectal enema up to one hour before the exam. Patients are also oriented to empty bladder completely and take two glasses of water immediately before the procedure. Patient positioning is also an important point to be considered because the pelvis should be elevated in order to allow free angulation of the probe to the posterior compartment. Using this model, you can have both patient and the examiner in ergonomic positions throughout the exam. And the maneuver is the key. Slide the probe into the posterior and anterior vaginal fornice according to the compartment being analyzed. Don't keep the probe in the anterior vaginal fornix through all the exam. Slide the probe into the posterior vaginal fornix. This is a very important maneuver. So moving on to imaging algorithm. Endometriosis is a multifocal disease with a predictable and repetitive distribution along the pelvic cavity. This is the most important imaging to memorize today. The most common locations of endometriosis in the anterior and posterior compartment of the pelvis. So let's start with the posterior compartment because this is the most affected compartment. Here we have to evaluate the heterocervical space, vagina, rectus sigmoid column, and the posterior uterine wall. The heterocervical space is the most common location of endometriosis and where the disease usually starts. 
the heterocervical space is the area located behind the cervix. It comprises the uterosacral ligaments, the pouch of Douglas, the torus uterino, and the posterior vaginal wall. To evaluate the heterocervical space, slide the probe into the posterior vaginal fornix and move it gently from right to left. This is the most important maneuver. And this is the normal aspect of the uterosacral ligaments through ultrasound. So we have a homogeneously hyperechoic tissue surrounding the cervix, the right and the left uterosacral ligament, homogeneously hyperechoic surrounding the cervix. And then basically any hypoechoic tissue located behind the cervix can be an endometriotic lesion. So we can see plaques, hypoechoic plaques, nodules, uni or bilateral, or also huge nodules attached to another lesion affecting the rectus sigmoid column. This is a very common presentation. Let's see some examples. A hypoechoic nodule located behind the cervix, the laparoscopic correlation. Let's see some clips. So sliding the probe into the posterior vaginal fornix, a axial plane, oblique axial plane, and then you can see this hypoechoic nodule infiltrating the right uterosacral ligament. Another example the sagittal plane and then axial plane. And then you can see this hypoechoic nodule containing small cystic areas and attached to the uh, rectus sigmoid column. Another example, a repetitive pattern, repetitive presentation, a hypoechoic nodule affecting the left uterosacral ligament. And here you can see uh, a bowel lesion attached to the heterocervical lesion. When the uterus is retroflex, TBSBP is particularly useful because sometimes can be really difficult to assess the heterocervical space using MRI. Using the TVS, you can push the probe and suddenly pull back and then open this heterocervical space and better see the nodule. This is another presentation of deeply infiltrative endometriosis. It's a marker for severe endometriosis. And when the heterocervical lesion deeply infiltrates the myometrium from outside in, this is commonly mistaken as adenomyosis, but this is deeply infiltrative endometriosis infiltrating the myometrium. Bowel lesions are among the most aggressive disease and the rectus sigmoid column is the most common location. TVSBP is the best imaging modality to investigate bowel lesions. Here we, we can evaluate the number of lesions, the size, the intestinal layers affected, distance to the anal border and circumference of the bowel affected. This is the normal aspect of the bowel wall through TVSPP. The very hypoechoic layer is the muscular layer, which is separated into internal and external layers by this thin hyperechoic line. And then the submucosa, which is hyperechoic. Endometriosis will always grow from outside in. So let's see a video demonstrating how to evaluate the bowel. You should follow the bowel, keeping an eye on the muscular layer, the very hypoechoic layer, because that is the most affected layer. Again, slide the probe into the posterior vaginal fornix and follow the bowel. You can go further up to 30 centimeters between the anal border and the descendant column. Let's see some examples here. You can follow the bowel and then you can see this hypoechoic thickening. 
located at the level of the peritoneal reflection. Another bowel lesion. Bowel lesions are eye-catching and difficult to miss using TVSPP. They are very hypoechoic with a fibrotic component. Cystic areas are rare among bowel lesions. And here is the laparoscopic correlation. <clears throat> More examples, when the muscularis is infiltrated, you can see this very hypoechoic nodule attached to the bowel wall and the submucosa overlying it is intact. When the submucosa is infiltrated, you can see this is small, gaps or speculated pattern into the submucosal layer. The axial plane is the best plane to investigate small bowel lesions. You just have to rotate the probe into the axial plane and then you can find these very tiny uh, lesions, less than one centimeter. And this is the laparoscopic correlation. TVSPP is the best imaging modality to investigate multiple bowel lesions, small bowel lesions. The circumference of the bowel affected, you just have to rotate the probe into the axial plane and estimate the circumference of the bowel affected. 3D reconstructions are very useful to demonstrate the C-shaped pattern of bowel lesions. It's also important to evaluate the distance to the anal border because the closer the lesion is to the anal border, the more difficult and risky it becomes to remove it. I use the peritoneal reflection as a landmark, which is located approximately nine centimeters to the anal border. Using MRI is easier because you can measure it directly. Multicentric disease is present when we have different bowel segments compromised by endometriosis. And I strongly recommend that you evaluate the descendant color and the iliosecal region through the abdominal wall using the linear transducer. Vaginal lesions are almost always an extension of a heterocervical lesion. To evaluate the vagina, again, slide the probe into the posterior vaginal fornix. The vagina gets stretched over the probe, three millimeters thick hypoechoic layer surrounded by the hyperechoic peritoneal tissue. If you are not sure about vaginal infiltration, you can apply 60 ml of gel and distend the posterior vaginal fornix and better see the nodule. Another example here, we have a heterocervical lesion attached to a vaginal lesion, a hypoechoic thickening of the posterior vaginal wall containing small cystic areas. The ureters can also be compromised by endometriosis, mainly by an extension of a large hetero or paracervical lesion. You can follow the urethral path retrospectively. Patients are oriented to take two glasses of water and 15 to 20 minutes later, you can follow the urethral path. The power Doppler can be used to demonstrate the urethral jet and you just have to wait in an axial plane a few seconds to see the urethral peristalsis and then you can provide the distance between the ureter and the heterocervical lesion. This is a very important information for surgeons. Let's see another example. A large heterocervical lesion infiltrating the distal ureter and causing hydronephrosis. Moving on to the anterior compartment, here we have to evaluate the round ligaments, bladder, vesicouterine pouch, and the anterior uterine wall. This is the normal aspect of the anterior compartment through laparoscopy. Surgeons cannot assess the bladder wall directly. To evaluate the bladder, slide the probe into the anterior vaginal fornix and look through the bladder wall from right to left, anterior and posterior. 
it's also important to evaluate the mobility between the posterior bladder dom and the anterior uterine wall. It's the so-called sliding sign, a bimanual examination and abdominal palpation combined with a gentle pushing the cervix. So let's see some examples. Here you can see a hypoechoic nodule attached to the posterior bladder dome containing a small cystic area and deeply infiltrating the detrusor muscle. Here you can see another example. Cystic areas are very common among bladder lesions. A hypoechoic thickening attached to the posterior bladder dome, the midline. And here you can see a 3D reconstruction demonstrating the projection of the nodule into the bladder lumen and the cystoscopic correlation. The round ligaments in the vesco-uterine pouch are very common locations of endometriosis in the anterior compartment and where endometriosis usually start. Here you can see a hypoechoic tissue with irregular margins attached to the anterior uterine wall near the round ligament insertion. This is the laparoscopic correlation. On MRI, they will present the same aspect. Here you can see that the bladder wall is preserved. Cystic areas are very common among um, these lesions and they can vary from small to large cystic cavities. It's also very important to assess ovarian mobility because a fixed ovary can, see, can be a sign of endometriosis. It's the same maneuver, the sliding sign and abdominal palpation combined with a gentle pushing the cervix. I'm not gonna talk about ovarian endometriomas. I just want to emphasize that if you see an endometrioma, you should look for dye lesions because endometriomas are a marker for severe endometriosis. Here you can see an endometrioma and then a heterocervical lesion, a bowel lesion, and also uh, a lot of adhesions. So it's a marker for severe endometriosis. Then don't miss the peritoneal thickening of the ovarian fossa. And endometriomas is almost always associated with a peritoneal thickening of the ovarian fossa. And here, the main importance of this finding is that because the urethral path will be very close to the peritoneal thickening. So you have to provide the distance between the urethral path and the peritoneal thickening. It's an invaluable information for surgeons. Here you can see the urethral path very close to the peritoneal thickening. Another important point to be considered, the diaphragma. Uh, severe pelvic endometriosis is frequently associated with endometriosis affecting the diaphragma. So take a look at the perihepatic space. You can find these hyperechoic plagues associated with small cystic cavities. The diaphragma is also a marker for severe pelvic endometriosis. And last but not least, the report. You can use a conventional report a, or a structured report. The advantage of the last one is that you can standardize nomenclature and data use among all involved. And I strongly recommend that you illustrate your findings using drawings or sketches that will be very useful for patients and surgeons to understand your findings. It's a real map to guide them during the procedure. So going back to Kelly's story, one year after the diagnosis, she had two IVF attempts without success, finally decided for surgery and had a robotic laparoscopic one with radical excision of all dye lesions. One year later, transferred two frozen embryos. And finally, she had Donatella, 
So she struggled for six years to get pregnant. Endometriosis is an underdiagnosed disease. Imaging mapping is crucial to the clinical management and treatment counseling. I invite you to include the search for dye lesions in your routine TVS. You can change patient's life story significantly. I thank you very much for your attention.